So Mark chapter 12, verse 35 to 37, the record longest innings in a game of test cricket is held by Hanif Muhammad, who was at the crease for 16 hours. 16 hours. Nothing could dislodge him. Spin, speed, he dealt with everything. As we've gone through this chapter in Mark 12, Jesus has been quizzed by the religious leaders who want him dead. They've tried trapping him with, with clever questions and arguments. Nothing could unsettle him. The final effort, he knocked for six. And now the religious leaders have given up. Verse 34, after that, no one dared ask him any more questions. So Jesus asks a question. He fires a single shot. They'd smothered him with their cleverly pre-planned, pre-formulated traps. He asks one simple question and nobody can answer it. Verse 35, how can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? Now, to understand what's going on here, we need to understand two things about Jesus' audience. First, the, the Jews are waiting for the Messiah. Throughout the Old Testament, God had promised a savior from heaven to rescue his people. And, and, and you know, the scribes are the Old Testament professors. They're the teachers, the ones with the responsibility for explaining and expounding God's word to God's people. Their most anticipated sermon topic, the most popular one, the one that everybody would come to sit and hear, was the coming Messiah. That's what the Jews' ears itched to hear about. Secondly, though, the Jews misunderstood the Messiah. In Indonesia, viruses show up very different to how they do here. Instead of the stuffy nose and the, the sore throat, you get a, an itchy rash. Now the problem is the virus inside, but all you can see and feel is the rash. Now from Genesis, God had promised the Messiah would save his people from sin. That's what he was coming to rescue them from through Adam and, and, and Eve. Sin had entered the world when they listened to the serpent, but the Messiah would crush the serpent's head. He was going to deal with sin and death at the source. But death and sin are like a virus. We see the symptoms in our lives. We can't get away from the symptoms in the world around us. But because the rash is itchy, we too easily forget the real problem. Now that's what happened in Israel. The Jews had this huge, visible problem, this consequence of sin that they couldn't escape. They were ruled by Rome. And so foreign governors made their laws and imposed foreign taxes which were enforced by foreign soldiers assisted by traitorous tax collectors. That was a big problem in the eyes of Israel. Rome was casting a shadow over politics, the economy, home, work and the future. And so that's what they need saving from. They see it every day. They can't get away from it. At work, at home, it's always there. This is how the Messiah then is going to save us from our big problem by breaking Caesar's iron grip over Israel and driving the legionnaires into the mat. You see, the religious leaders hadn't come to Scripture intending to twist it, at least not initially. But they made the mistake of interpreting God's word in light of their need. See, rather than letting God's word tell them what they needed, they brought their need to scripture and read it through the lens of their need. They hated Rome. They knew that the people hated Rome. And so they taught what they wanted the word to say. They made the Messiah into a, a military savior. Now I want you to see how perceived need, what they thought they needed, shaped their exegesis. And that word means the way we understand and explain the Bible. You think of how people lost in the desert sometimes claim to see water where there isn't any and, and they're just so desperate that their mind makes them see what isn't there. The same can happen when we read the Bible. Sometimes we want it to say something so badly we see what isn't there. I remember one time as a teenager, I met this lovely girl called Joy. What should I do? Well, I opened the Bible because I knew somewhere in Isaiah it said, you shall go out with Joy. And <laughs> that's not what that text is teaching. <laughs> 
<laughs> See, when somebody has a deep need, when somebody feels a deep need, it's easy to take advantage of them by telling them what they want to hear. And when you have a deep need, it's easy to deceive yourself by telling yourself what you want to hear. And this is why prosperity preachers are so successful. Because they prey on people's felt financial or physical need. And I have no doubt that the vast majority of them believe what they preach. Because they also feel a need for money or status. We watched about five minutes of Joel Osteen yesterday. Twisting God's word. To make it appeal to people's financial, physical need. Now that's what was happening with the scribes. They had a need and their hearers had a need and they convinced themselves that Messiah, that God would answer that need and they found a great Bible passage to back it up. God's promise to David. Moreover, the Lord declares to you, this is God's promise to David through Samuel, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers. I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. See, God had promised the Messiah would come from David's family, that David would have a descendant it would have an everlasting kingdom. It would know no end. So the scribes jumped on this. If he's David's son, this Messiah, if he's to come from the line of David, it must mean he's going to be like David. Now what's important about David? Well, he's a warrior king. He's Israel's greatest. He's the one who expanded the kingdom and killed giants. So that's who the Messiah is going to be. He's David's boy, a shadow of David, a second David to restore Israel's financial and political and military fortunes. Do you hear how that interpretation is soaked, saturated in their need? It doesn't do any justice to the text but it's exactly what Israel ached to hear. The great problem with that kind of teaching is that it ignores the condition of people's souls. It spoke to thin wallets and patriotic heads, but not to broken hearts. It promised a cure for the rash, but not the virus. The surface needs had distracted the people completely from their real need. Next thing I want you to see is the real danger of letting your need shape your view of Jesus. The reason I'm stressing this is, is first because it's the meaning of the passage that we're looking at, but secondly, there's a, a real threat, a serious danger that you could make exactly the same mistake. See, how you go to the four square is very different from how you go to the doctors. You don't go to the GP with a list of drugs for him to prescribe, Doc, I need this, 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 and maybe some of this if you've got it in stock. And in the same way, you don't go to the four square, sit down in Brock's office and say, just tell me straight, Brock, what do I need? <laughs> if you do that, it's likely that Brock will call the doctor. <laughs> See, we can look in the cupboard and we can see what's missing and we can see what's running low and we can make a list. We're qualified to do that. But we can't look into our bodies and determine what's wrong. We go to Brock with demands. I need milk, bread and tea. We go to the GP with questions. Now, some of you act like the scribes. You think you know the condition of your soul and the needs of your soul better than God. And so you come to church in the same way as you go to the four square with a list of demands. God, give me better health. I'm coming because I need to pray for another grandchild. Give me relief from my circumstances. I need more money. I need a holiday. I need a relationship. Perhaps you have a, a genuine Christ-honoring desire this morning. You've got a plea for spiritual growth. You say, Lord, restore to me the joy of my salvation. God has power to answer all of those needs. He's promised to, to meet all of his people's needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. But what kind of God 
would the good God of heaven be if he gave you what you thought you needed when he knows far better? What kind of God would he be if he gave you what you came asking for when he knows you need the absolute opposite? What if he gave you that joy in your salvation when what you need this morning is rebuke and repentance? What if you spent all week toying with your sin? What kind of God would he be if he gave you joy? It'd be like a father coming home finding his kid playing with his rifle and giving him a bag of sweets. What if God gave you health or success and then left you to die in your sin? See, when we open our Bibles, when we pray, especially when we come to church, we must stuff our demands deep in our pockets. We don't get rid of them completely. There's a time to come before God, but we stuff them deep down into our pockets and first we pray, God, what do you have for me today? We come with questions to our God. Some of you need to ask the most basic questions of all. What's wrong with me? Why do I live the way I do? Why do I act the way I do? I want to be a good person, but it doesn't seem to work. What's wrong with me? He'll say, your heart is ruined by sin. Well, what will happen if it isn't treated? You'll spend eternity in hell. How long do I have? You have this moment. After that, there are no guarantees. Is there any hope? Yes. Immense hope. Can I be treated? Yes, but it will cost you everything. But it's worth it if heaven and hell are on the line, right? Absolutely. So what must I do? Nothing, says the Lord Jesus. I've done it all. I died on the cross and took your punishment on myself. I suffered the hell that you deserve so you don't have to. All you must do this morning is believe. You must turn from your way of life. Ask God to forgive your sin. And you must believe that Christ's death satisfied all of God's justice and his resurrection is your guarantee of eternal life. Will it work? Yes. This surgery of the great physician has a 100% success rate. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Christian, it's the same for you. You must come asking questions. We feel that if we've gone home from church unhappy, something's gone wrong. What if God wants you to leave unhappy? We must pray every sermon. What do you have for me? See, if we don't think like that, if we don't come humbly with open hands before God and say, what do you have to say to me this morning, living God? We'll hear the sermon and we'll only apply it to the area of our lives we've been struggling with that week. You know what I'm talking about. We all come and there's something in the forefront of your mind as you walk through that door this morning. I hope God speaks to that this morning. That's my real need. That's what I'm struggling with this week. And then whatever's been said, we can only ever apply it to that one specific thing. Or we think if, if, or if the sermon doesn't speak to that one issue, well, maybe God hasn't spoken at all this morning. What nonsense. What if God has a completely different area of your life that he wishes to speak into? That everything else is hanging on. That your big issue would be answered by if only you were willing to listen this morning. The other thing that we do, and, and if, if your heart's like mine, you'll know that this is true. That there are parts of our lives that we're happy to have challenged. There are parts of our lives that we're, we're happy for God to, to rebuke us on. And we'll apply the sermon to those bits. But then there are other areas we want him to leave well alone. Don't challenge my comfort and my happiness. And so do you see what we've done? We've made God our grocer rather than our healer. And we've come to him with demands rather than questions. And if that's you, you must repent and come humbly to God's word. You treat him as Lord with the right to rule every area of your life. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, your joy to gloom. Humble yourself before the Lord and he will exalt you. 
Israel was so busy seeking a military savior that they were missing the true Messiah who could save their souls from hell. Oh, it's so important to see who Jesus is, to know who Jesus really is. And that's why he asks this question. It's all about the Messiah's true identity. See, three things first. Let's just read these words again. Verse 36, David himself in the Holy Spirit declared, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I put your enemies under your feet. David calls him Lord, so how can he be his son? See, three things about the the true nature of the Messiah revealed in these words. First, he's David's son, and that's true in, in three ways. The Lord Jesus is David's son. First, biologically, through both his, his mother, whose genealogy is recorded in Luke's gospel, and his, his um, non-biological but legal father, whose genealogy is recorded in Matthew's gospel, he is linked to, to King David. So he's in the family line of David, but also prophetically he's David's son. He's the fulfillment of this covenant with David. He's the one whose kingdom would be an everlasting kingdom, the one whom Isaiah said of, of his greatness, of his government and peace. There will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness. From that time on and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. And then thirdly, symbolically, Thanks to Josh this morning, we heard a little bit about the uh, beautiful quality of Indonesian bathrooms. Now, a dirty bathroom is the height of middle-class Kiwi embarrassment. But in Indonesia, in <laughs> bathrooms are filthy, nobody cares. Heaven and earth have very different standards. What God considers great is very often very different from what man considers great. And the Jews admired David as a great warrior. But God loved David because he was a man after his own heart. That was real greatness. And it's there that Jesus not only reflects but completely outshines David. A man after God's own heart. A man who was always in submission to the will of the Father and loved to do his will. Secondly, see the Messiah. He's, he's the Lord of David. He's greater than David. And this is the real scandal of Jesus' words because to the scribes, the Messiah was David's son. So he couldn't be greater than David. But Psalm 110, David writes, the Lord, Yahweh. So God said to my Lord, Ladonai. And then he describes the Messiah, his son. See, if the Messiah is just a type of David, how can David call him Lord? And so Jesus is revealing his true identity. He's saying that, that he who comes after David is greater than David. That's true in, in two specific ways. His kingdom is greater. See, David's empire boomed militarily and economically. New trade deals were made, battles were won. Israel knew prosperity and security. But Jesus' kingdom... It's called the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. And it's a kingdom that can't be measured in land because it's not of this world. Its hallmarks are justice and joy. Its citizens are the happiest, most privileged people in the cosmos. And that doesn't mean that they're immune to sorrow now. But I think of my sister in the Lord Jesus, Jane Dyack, who as she's dying of cancer could still say, solid joys and lasting treasures. None but Zion's children know. The kingdom of the Lord Jesus has no borders because he reigns in the hearts of those he's rescued from sin and hell. Everywhere Christ has people, his kingdom is. And everywhere Christ has people. In Saudi Arabia and North Korea, in the White House and the Kremlin, his kingdom will grow until he comes again in glory and in power to take his citizens to their eternal home. Jesus shall reign where'er the sun does his successive journeys run. His kingdom stretch from shore to shore till moon shall wax and wane no more. His kingdom is greater than David's kingdom. Then his nature is greater too. David was a, a great king, but he sinned terribly. And the Bible doesn't try to hide that. It doesn't whitewash its heroes. And so we can trust it. It gives us confidence to rely on it when it presents us with Jesus, the perfect man. David was a, a sinner who needed a savior, someone greater than himself to deal with his sin and make him right with God. He needed a Lord. 
that he could rely on and trust and cling to and love. Jesus was that Lord. David called him my Lord. Do you know Jesus that way? You think how else David wrote about him? The Lord is my shepherd. You think of Thomas. My God. My Lord. Only a Christian can talk that way. Personal rich way that they know their God. Thirdly, we see this Messiah as the, the Lord of all. So you consider the final words in this quote of the Lord Jesus from Psalm 110. Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. <coughs> There's coming a time when all Jesus' enemies will be defeated and placed under his rule. So the Bible only ever speaks about two kinds of people. There are Jesus' friends and there are his enemies. And there is nobody else in the whole history of our world. There is no other category for you to be in Today, there are sheep and there are goats. There is wheat and there is chaff. You may not be violently opposed to Jesus. You may even only have good things to say about him. But if you are not for Jesus, heart and soul, you're against him. If you're not trusting him and him alone for salvation, pursuing him, obeying him as Lord and God, you have no hope of heaven. You read these words and take a long look at your destiny. You may not worship this Jesus now, but you will. God will put all his enemies under his feet. Very briefly, look at verse 37. David himself calls him Lord, so how is he his son? The great throng heard him gladly. If you're not a Christian, you might feel that this is miserable news. But it's not. Because you're alive and you're here by God's grace. And there's opportunity to deal with this Lord Jesus this morning. This miserable news could be the best news you've ever heard if you give up on your resistance and take Jesus at his word. You don't switch off your mind. You must never do that. But you come to Jesus with questions rather than demands. You humble yourself before David's greatest son, the, the Messiah, sent by God at great personal cost to satisfy his justice and ransom your soul from hell. Let's pray.